Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Capitalize Theater. My name is Jay Williams. I'm with StoryTech. And StoryTech, we've curated a lot of the panels that you're seeing here today, and we're really excited to bring you our next panel here uh, about the transformative impact of digital backlots. Before we do that, just want to remind everyone that StoryTech is also doing a lot of great tours here at NAB. And I like to say it's really kind of a great way to get sort of the executive summary, if you will, of all the booths that are taking place here. And we've got categories like AI, television, uh, VR, data. Uh, and if you are interested, you can get registered for these tours at registration or better yet, you can stop upstairs at room 218. There is a code you can scan and get registered right there. But uh, we'll be doing those tours throughout the rest of the NAB show. So hopefully you can take part in that. So with that, very excited about uh, this afternoon's panel here. And I'm going to turn the floor over to our moderator, who also happens to be the co-founder and CEO of Global Objects. Please welcome Jess Lauren. Thank you, Jay. Everyone walking by, please join us. Join us. Take a seat. Uh, my name is Jess Loren. I am the CEO of Global Objects. I will be your moderator today. And we're so lucky to have two lovely humans here, Jerome Prescott from the Disney Studios and Eric Eisler from Global Objects. So today, I thought we'd start off with uh, what is a digital backlot? So if you're not familiar, uh, I would love to ask both of you this question. All right, I can go first. So digital, a digital backlot, a digital set. Uh, it's a set. It's a backlot. It's this, it's, it's what we've traditionally come to know in the real world, but a twin or a replica of it, uh, as an asset in the digital world. And because it is, uh, a set or a prop or an, an element that, that is part of that, you, you have to think about it kind of the same way you think about traditional sets and, and props and elements. Um, it's just that now uh, you have a lot more creative freedom to use those things in a lot more imaginative ways. So where, where before you would have to, uh, you would have a, a fixed asset that was hard to move around, would take a crew of people to assemble. You now have a digital asset that you can, send and transform into various different things. So think of, of a digital backlot or a digital set as as its traditional roots, but with a lot more creative freedom. Um, so from the perspective of studios, I'll give you a different spin on that. So for us, digital backlot is a lot of content. So when you think about the amount of diversity that goes into an actual set, we are now looking at all of the different elements that come together to make that occur. So for a lot of our studios, a digital backlog is that centralized place of where all of these things are coming together to allow the film creation process to happen in a very unique and advanced way that allows for this process to create the output that we're looking for. So it's really that culmination of different now parts of the workflow coming together in a very abstract form to allow that creation to happen. So from the audience, how many of you have actually worked with virtual production or digital sets? A couple, a couple here and there. Okay, great. So what would you say are the primary advantages, uh, Eric, to working with these digital environments? So there are a few different advantages to working with these environments, particularly, so when you have, so a backlot or a set, you know, backlots in, in the traditional sense used to be in on the back lot of 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 the studio. They would take their studios and instead of having these giant, you know, ugly buildings, they would they would uh, cover them with these facades that were brick buildings, or they would make a New York Street or you know San Francisco Street. They would they would utilize uh, as a as a filming location. So in the digital sense, you have all of these, all of these sets are essentially the same thing, but now you've got the ability to use those in different ways. So if you have a virtual production, for example, and you want to bring somebody, uh, to New York, and then you want to change that set to be in the Arctic, um, that's about, you know, 15 to 25 minute changeover. Whereas in you would have to take your crew and drive them from New York to the Arctic. It's a little bit more, uh, of a heavy lift. So 
what you really get, the advantages of having uh, is a versatility in production and a modality that you wouldn't necessarily get, uh, traditionally speaking. And from the studio side, Jerome, what are the primary advantages of why studios of, you know, such as the Disney's caliber that are going to these digital sets? So I'll give it to you from a story perspective. How many people here like movies? Great. Um, and how, how many people like to be able to go experience movies consistently? Great. The process to take a, to create a movie takes time. Time is a very huge factor. So I, I'm sure everyone in this room can consider how many different output forms there are for content right now. So we have streaming services, we have movie theaters, and we now have experiential moving into things like Apple Vision Pro and a number of other areas for us, including parks. So when we look at this perspective, that is a large amount of content creation. And time is a huge factor. Time, location, space, people, and a number of different facets. So when we talk about this area, we're talking about the ability to reduce that time, have capability and functionality, and extend your creative workflow. And that is really important from the studio perspective because it's all about enabling the creative to have that facility and use that facility to actually extend both their creative process and the ability to deliver that output of that completed film. Jerome, you mentioned enabling creators. So, Eric, as a creator, how do you feel these environments enable you and in creating these worlds and putting them onto, you know, working with Disney, et cetera? Well, it's, it's interesting because you really get a sense that you can do, you can do things on these sets that in experiment and, and do things that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do on a real set. A real set is a fixed asset. It's, it's hard. It's sometimes nailed to the ground, right? But a digital set is, 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 is modal and, and movable and you can actually spin the entire world around you. So what that does is it changes the creative thinking of how how you're going to go and find a shot where you're going to go and look for something it's not it's 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 completely movable completely changeable completely scalable so you can start to play with things like size dimension um it's 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 a you have to start thinking about it a different way because it's truly a different medium at that point so I know one of the things that you're doing at Global Objects or we're doing at Global Objects is building out what we're calling scapes. Can you walk us through the process of creating a scape? And then, Jerome, if you can fill in how potentially a large studio like Disney could see something like having a library of environments. We'll start with you, Eric. Sure. So one of the one of the big issues, barrier, barriers to entry in virtual production is in order to create a, a really believable uh, setup, it's a lot of work, right? It's a lot of bespoke work, a lot of time that artists have to, to create these digital assets. And the problem is, is that, you know, that, as Jerome was saying earlier, that's a lot of time to, that it takes. So our, our goal is to create a library of prefab digital assets. Think about it like, you know, there used to be these Dura trances that you could, you could rent. You, you want, you know, you want a New York skyline or you want, uh, you know, an airport. You would just sort of like thumb through the catalog at the studio and go, yeah, I want that one. And they would hang it for you. And, and there was a day, a day look at a night look. The day look could be, could be front lit from lights on the set. The night look was a, a backlit look. Um, and then you would, you know, you would build your, your, your window in front of the New York skyline and you would have your set. Well, in virtual production, if you wanted a New York skyline, now you've got to get a bunch of guys together who know how to build these assets. You have to fly them out to New York to take, you know, pictures or do scans. And then you have to assemble this, this stuff and then get it running, uh, in, in a game engine. So Unreal Engine, you have, you have to have a skill set to be able to, to make it look really good in Unreal Engine. And then you have to get it up and running. And that's a heavy lift for, for filmmakers at a certain tier. Um, at, at studio level like that, you know, it, it's absolutely a, obtainable, but for anybody in the lower tiered, you know, motion pictures, it's, that's a heavy lift and it's, and it can often be really expensive with varying results depending on the artistry and the people you're able to assemble. So what we're trying to do is put together some prefab scapes that, that are designed by filmmakers for filmmakers. So, Pre, prefab settings that that have been already crafted, all the heavy lift is done, the work is already done, and we're doing it 
and making it so that it, it's also you can take these as a starting position if you want to start with it and then enhance it. You can do that. Or if you want to, um, you know, just use it as is, you can use it as is. So so the idea is to take the heavy lifting of having to go acquire all of the things that you need to make these sets and to, and to deliver them to you in a catalog where you can literally just pick them out and go, you know, I want this or I want that or I want this and know with confidence that it's going to look great and run uh, perfectly inside of Unreal Engine. It's going to be uh, a perfect asset that you can just turn on on a virtual production environment and it works. So how many people have watched Mandalorian? Great. So a lot of people. So arguably that was the show that introduced a lot of us to virtual production. So Jerome, I'd love to hear from your perspective of Disney putting out Mandalorian. You know, how has that transformed what the studio is doing with virtual production and moving into, do you want to use prefab sets or is it all bespoke and how does that workflow look? So um, from a, I'll give you from a very interesting perspective and I'll use some analogies along the way to kind of help you through this concept. So, when you are working on these type of sets, you're working on these type of productions, there's a lot of elements that affect what you want to have as an output. So there's a combination and there's a world where creative meets technical to deliver a vision. Now, I'm going to use this example to kind of take you through this. So how many people here in this room, when you were younger, have been used a coloring book at some point in your life? All right, great. So that's a very creative process. You have to take there, use the colors, fill it out. But the technical part of that was somebody had to lay out what the lines were, where they were going to be, what the pictures were going to be, what book it was going to be in, and all of the other elements. Now, you took that coloring book, and you were able to then apply what creative elements you want. I didn't tell you which colors. I didn't give you the direction. You just decided to make it what you want as your final output. When we think about it this way, it's a very similar concept. We are taking the ability to have that creative tool set and apply the engines and technology behind it to arrive at the output. So the concept really travels in a way that makes it less difficult. And when we talk about this, it's very similar. So when we talk about the creative process, early in the workflow, you know, you have ideas. Well, how can I look at an idea? You have to translate that idea into something that is materialistic in the world. Well, doing having assets, having digital aspects, allow you to take that creative idea bring it to the world, and start looking at it and playing with it. Then you travel through that journey of, well, what does the next step of that look like? And what that what does the continuation of that look like? Well, how is it going to look on a camera? Well, how is it going to look in 3D? And now with the advent of other tools, Apple Vision Pro and a number of other viewing tools, what is that going to look like in dimensional space? So as you go forward in this, and we're looking at this technology, the concept really comes back into how do you grab the elements, to color the coloring book. And I really like to go back to analogies because this can become a very complex area. It can become very overwhelming. But in its basic simplicity, it's the ability to take something, grab the technology behind it, and really paint the picture that you want. Yeah, echoing that, something that's interesting is when the, when the Mandalorian came out, it, it was transformative because they, they developed the technology because they didn't want to shoot this on a green screen. Cause it was a, it was a chrome guy. <laughs> you put a chrome guy in front of a green screen. It's a, it's a green guy. <laughs> and that doesn't work very well in visual effects, keying out a green guy. So they developed this technology to, to solve that problem. And in doing so birthed an entire new way of filmmaking, which is hearkening back to the old days of filmmaking where they used to go out and do rear screen projection. They would shoot plates and project it out behind. So instead of projecting in front of a screen like like on a television, they would project behind the screen and then put an actor in front of that and light the actor. So this now, hearkening back to that, we have a new technology and now it's it's in it's still it's in its very early primitive stages. So we are now just getting down to figure out standards and practices and even what people's titles should be for these. For the, for the, uh, you got no, it. that's it's great. And what was your favorite coloring book? Mine was My Little Pony. <laughs> so um, let, let's talk about digital rights management then. And you said, you know, standards and procedures from the studio side, Jerome. How are you managing these assets? And how would you say people are moving forward with the security side, with you know, managing all of this IP? So security is a very interesting aspect in this workflow. So um, let's think about a perspective here with 
elements for a production? How many, how many elements do you think exist? When, and by elements, I mean assets on an average virtual production. Anybody? I, I can guess. <laughs> In the thousand. Exactly. So that is monumentally large. It's a huge amount of not just data, but elements that come together to make it work down to the dimensions of chairs, the colors, the aspects around it. That's a lot of data in a lot of different areas. And let's just throw something in there. Let's change day to night. Let's change shading. Let's change positioning. Let's change where I want you to be in relation to space, right? And you understand that the significance of that moves along. So the concept here from a content perspective is this is a lot of content. This is a lot of content in a lot of areas. And for us, free release content is very significant because we we don't want to spoil the story. If you hear about it beforehand, we're, we're spoiling the experience. And we really want, and it's important to us to hold that experience close and really allow you to have that experience when the creatives give their vision. As anybody in here at any point working with creatives or as a creative, your point is to deliver that final version of that story to make the impact that you want to. So the content security aspect of it, of making sure that all the elements within the production are secure is very key. And within virtual production as an evolving space, there's a constant drive to continue to keep those assets secure and keep all the elements that we have working. Yeah, so security in virtual production right now is really tough because just just to light up a, an LED wall with multiple, you need multiple computers depending on the resolution to drive pieces of the wall. Each one of those computers has to have an exact copy of all the files of the other computers. And sometimes you have nine or 10 or 11 of these nodes that are driving. So now it's, it's nine copies of all of these things. And, and so just to keep track of all of, all of those copies and all of the changes that may occur between the copies, there is uh, some software that gets used where if you make a change to anything in your in your set, it has to push those changes out to all the different copies. So now from a security perspective, think about it. You you have an asset that it's getting copied all over the place. It's it can be a nightmare. So um security is is now coming into understanding that okay, there needs to be standards and practices for this. Um, and that's something that actually Jerome is developing. And it will be a standard in practice for all of the major studios. Yeah, it's definitely something that we, we, we as an industry, this happens a lot as we go through the industry. We we come up with practices, we come up with concepts, and we're working on technologies. And then we, we just develop, develop, develop. And then we all look back in the rearview mirror and say, oh, wait, hang on. Is there a standard best practice for doing this? Is there a proper way of doing this? Is there a guideline for this? Um and we tend to look in the rearview mirror and then step forward and say, oh, we should probably set up some standards for this and set up proper ways of doing it so that we don't get ourselves in trouble or risk problems with the content. So when we're dealing with things from a studio perspective, and by the way, like just my, our studios is seven on the studio side and a number of other ones on the TV side. So that's a lot of studios. That is a lot of projects. That is a lot of content. So it's moving through an entire ecosystem with vendors, with, you know, creatives, with technology, and it's that paradigm shift of all of that data moving around. So the the value of importance of that and keeping that pre-release information secure and keeping us in a state of mind where we understand the value of it and know, hey, we wanted to keep this going. We have to consider all of the elements to really help standardize that and keep it going forward. Yeah, one one other thing to that, which is the problem with 3D content is, it used to, it used to just, the creators used to be the ones that had the 3D content. But today, everybody has 3D content, right? So, so you went from a, a world where it was like the masters. You used to have your, your tape masters or your film masters, but now everybody's got a copy of your masters, right? So it becomes a significant, uh, change. And the problem is, is that the, the technology right now in creating objects, 3D data is that there wasn't really DRM in mind. Um, when it was developed. So there isn't really a, an effective DRM system for 3D content uh, because once you have it, you have it, right? And then once you have it, you can give it to somebody else. Um, so 
that, you know, there is a lot of talk about this right now in the industry. How do we effectively secure and have DRM for 3D content? It is not a solved subject and it's definitely something that is evolving. So Eric, you brought us some content um, that you've recently been working on with a project with Rob Lowe. Can you walk us through the workflow and um, the project? Sure, sure. So um, for this particular project, it was uh, Rob Lowe was going to do some stand-ups for uh, a show about the Boston Tea Party, and so he was injured. And it was a it was a show that was a combination of recreations and and uh, experts, uh, and it was. He, he was, he was doing stand-ups to sort of introduce each new section. And they shot, uh, a lot of this show was shot in Mystic, Connecticut, uh, at this really old, uh, seaport that's still sort of intact. And so what they did was they, they contacted us to go to Mystic, Connecticut and, and actually acquire the seaport and then create a digital backlot and a digital set for us to bring back to Los Angeles to shoot with Rob Lowe. Rob Lowe is a very high-end actor. He, he commands a very large salary. So it was easier to send a team of us to Mystic and scan and create the seaport and bring it back to a virtual set in Los Angeles and more cost-effective than sending Rob to Mystic Seaport. So from a producerial standpoint, you know, producers are now thinking about that. If, if I can bring the mountain to Mohammed, <laughs> it's a little bit easier than trying to do it the other way. So, um, we went out to Mystic. We, we scanned, uh, both terrestrially and aerially, uh, with LIDAR and photogrammetry, um, probably about half a mile of the entire seaport. We then brought that data back to Los Angeles to our headquarters and we brought that into, uh, modeling software where we digitized and, and cleaned up the data. And then we created levels inside of both Unreal Engine. We also took really high resolution 360, uh, HDR images from a lot of different positions there on the seaport as well. And we were able to create a data set of both Unreal Engine assets that we could, that we could use, uh, on the virtual production backdrop and also created these high resolution images that we also could use. And, and interestingly enough, it, like, there's nothing that looks better than, than mother nature, right? So, um, we used probably half, half of the things that we did were these 360 backdrops and the other half was the Unreal Engine assets. So it was about a 50 50 use case. Now you mentioned cost savings and this particular project we did with Fox, uh, there was a 75% savings, um, going the virtual production route. Jerome, would you say that on the studio side with Disney, you are moving into more virtual production because of these cost savings? So what what I can speak on in regards to that is the reality of the workflow. So there is a high demand from co- for content everywhere. And as we go through this high demand for content, you have to be able to do things quicker, faster, and more efficiently. That's just the reality of film production in current day. Now, one thing that I want to kind of highlight here is the misconception from from the term virtual production, we tend to think with the word virtual production as being and living in the world of production only. And that in actual fact, it is one of the most multidimensional processes you'll come across. It is very post-production heavy. It is production heavy and it is also pre-production heavy. So having that workflow really makes you understand that it is a multidimensional process, meaning that Virtual production is used heavily in tech scouting, in frontline um, estimation for elements, for um, for location scouting, and a number of other things as part of a pre-production process. It is used for stunt viz. It is used for pre-viz. And as you go down the production line, you realize that there's a lot of elements. All, all the vizs. <laughs> all the vizs. <laughs> you realize that all the vizs are, are, are part of it. Well, then you get into actual production where you use elements 40 from the visas, and then you get into post, which you have to design for it. So it's a very circular workflow, unlike any other workflow that you see in current day. And most importantly, it allows you the fortitude to do things quicker. It allows you to save. If I can preview something, then I can save the time, energy, and effort and make decisions about it. And that in itself is a cost saving and one that applies to any studio in our, in our, in our 
Realm and other studios as well. Great. Thank you. So we have a couple of minutes left. I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, scary AI, boo. <laughs> um, how will AI impact these digital backlots as well as how is gener- generative AI um, on the studio side, Jerome and, and Eric, in your world, um, what does AI look like for global objects? Well, it's an interesting question. So uh, generative AI is a really interesting topic because it basically allows you to leverage uh, a lot of what is now done by hand artwork uh, that takes a lot of time and a lot of artistry, uh, r- rapid prototyping and ra- rapid succession. So, if we can take the ability to to really make uh, a data set, a computer to understand a data set enough to be able to create a set, um, it sort of opens the door for a creative process. So now, uh, as a creative, I can go, okay, hey, you know, I want to do a story. I want it to take place uh, in medieval times. It needs to be at a medieval castle, but I want it to have um, a steampunk flair to it, right? Uh, that's a very specific vision, right? And, uh, if you can get there with generative AI, uh, it's going to save time. Time saves money and that allows you to generate content quicker. So I think the change that we're going to see in our industry is more along the lines of it isn't that robots are taking over our job. It's that the people that talk to the robots are taking over our job because they are using it to leverage themselves up. It's like, I, I tell everybody this, a- AI is, 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 uh, it's Jarvis for, for Tony Stark, right? Like without, without Jarvis, he really isn't a superhero, right? So you, so you get Jarvis and he talks to Jarvis and him and Jarvis are, are a team. That's what AI is like in generative AI and, and, and machine learning. It's, it, it leverages you up. It gives you the power of an illustrator, the power of a writer, the power of all these things. And as a creative, those are pretty interesting tools. The danger in it all is that when that happens, when you or I or anybody is as creative as the best illustrator, the best writer, the best everything, um, now that sort of waters everything down, right? Because we're looking for content that's bespoke and created and, and has a certain vision. But as soon as everybody's content is always as great as everybody else's, everything gets watered down, and now it's it's not cool anymore. <laughs> so... And Jerome on the studio side? Um, I knew this question was going to come somewhere, somehow, sometime. Um, <laughs> but this is what I can say. Um, our perspective and what we look at and what I can say from my world is always about protecting the content. So the, the primary driver in a lot of the things we do is going to be looking at and protecting what is being created and how it's being created and the creative workflow. So our world, regardless of technology, regardless of advancements in technology, is going to always be centricated about the protection of content and the protection of that content process. So regardless of where elements get introduced and what the future state of those elements are, a major aspect from our perspective is going to be, hey, how do we protect content, right? And by protecting content, we're looking at the people who create it. And there's a really beautiful ecosystem in understanding that as a creative process. And what we do and how we look at it involves the ability to really say, hey, what do we do and how do we go through standards and best practices to establish what protecting that content looks like? And really that advancement is going to take some time. It's going to take some understanding. It's going to take establishing what the guidelines and procedures are going to be, but it's really centricated on the one premise. How do we protect the content that we create? And how to continue to protect the content that we create. And that's, that's an interesting topic because a lot of people are having these discussions now about, uh, let's train a data set on all of the Walt Disney content, for example, to be able to make it so that you can't do things with it with, uh, generative AI. So Thank for, you, Eric. Yeah. We'll stop there with the rules. The rules. <laughs> um, Jerome and Eric are going to take questions in the back. We're so glad to have you today. Thank you so much for attending our session. And everyone have a great rest of your NAB.